And welcome back to the Dog Central Live video show slash podcast. I am Graham Coffey. Uh, as always, I am joined by my friend John at John Tweet Sports on Twitter. We are here to get down to the nitty gritty. Number one AP poll team versus number one college football playoff team. The first number one versus number one matchup in the playoff era, which started in 2014 will be this Saturday in Sanford Stadium, 3.30 p.m. Underneath the lights. Well, it'll be lights in the second half because yeah. daylight saving time is this weekend. But anyways, big game, lots of hype, college game day coming to town, all sorts of recruits coming to town. Uh, everyone's talking about it. 93% of the public money on the Tennessee Volunteers getting eight points. John, how are we feeling? Man, I, uh, you know, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster of emotions. Um, one number one versus number one. Who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> who, who who can't get up for a number one versus number one? Um, no, it's been you know. It's, I think came into the week feeling very motivated. You get through about Wednesday and you kind of start seeing money coming in heavily on Tennessee and then you start thinking about that and then then you realize like Vegas moved the line from 11 and a half down to eight and it's stuck there and so either they are absolutely okay with mass amounts of money being on Tennessee um, or or the large percentage of the money um, or um, they're incredibly you know stupid um, because when you have 92% of the money on Tennessee, and the, that. And the line, exactly, and the line is not moving, so they are not stupid. So, when I saw that, I felt a, I felt a little bit better. When I started watching film that we're going to watch today, I felt a lot better, yeah. Um, so I'm in a good place here, I'm ready for, for this uh, to happen. I think you know, Georgia, you mentioned the recruits that are going to be there, uh, the atmosphere. Um, Georgia, you know, are, is are honoring Vince Dooley and Charlie Trippy with their names on the field and the red outline of the of, mm -hmm. of Dooley Field. I mean, I think it's it's going to be a show. So, really excited to get to it. Yes, in terms of hype, build up, atmosphere, um, this is going to be Sanford Stadium at its best. Uh, to kind of touch on your Vegas point, in the words of my father. They didn't get all that air conditioning in the desert by mistake, folks. So, you know, in, in the small sample size, yes, it's possible for Vegas to be wrong. In the large sample size, they're obviously right more often than yeah. not. Uh, and Vegas is basically heavily invested in Georgia in this game, right? And mm -hmm. uh, they seem content with that because there has been enough money put on Tennessee to justify taking this line to a touchdown or less. But they don't want to hang Georgia minus seven which is interesting. You know, it's not the end-all be-all, but uh, I believe it was our friends at College Football Nerds mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, I think both of us have watched their preview that they put out on Monday or Tuesday. Those guys do a really good job. Um, you know, Vegas hanging this spread at over two possessions basically equates to a, a, an 80-plus percent chance of Georgia winning straight up. So Correct. there's just a massive delta between mm – -hmm where this line is what Vegas feels like is happening and where, you know, the the public is. If you get on Twitter, I mean, like, dude, you know, it feels like Georgia doesn't have a shot in this game in some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you've got people like Matt Hayes writing that, you know, Tennessee's going to blow Georgia out and they're 29 LSU and all of that. Yeah. You've got yeah. like, there's just a lot of energy behind Tennessee this weekend. Um, yeah, I, I mean ten, Tennessee. You know, the Tennessee 2019 LSU comparisons are have been. That's been a that's been a leap, man. That's been that's been really interesting. <laughs> I don't think even Tennessee. I mean, I don't even think Tennessee. I don't think Josh Heupel would step back and say, "I have 14 draft picks." on no. this team. Um, no. And I also don't think you would step back and say like Hendon Hooker is going to throw for 60 touchdowns and <laughs> 5,678 yards. Right. Like, I, I mean, no, it's, it's that comparison when that, when those started rolling this week, you know, I think 
um, man, that is a tough hill to climb. If that's what you're expecting out of Tennessee this weekend and the rest of this year, um, I, I again watching the film, which we're going to get into, I just don't see it. And and I think uh, there there's <laughs> I'm not going to say that Tennessee is 2014. Mississippi State, but I do feel like there are more comparisons to a 2014 Mississippi State, right? Where, where Mississippi State, you know, came in number one in the CFP rankings, uh, offense clicking on all cylinders, had a defense playing decently, um, and again, you know, they hadn't beaten Alabama, but they had beaten the number eight and the number two team in the country. I think Auburn and LSU at the time, and had won big games, and then, uh, you know, and then they ended up losing. Uh, three or four games by the end of that season. And so I, I, I don't think Tennessee is going to do that, but I also don't think um, this, this team, if you look at the media narrative, you are definitely hearing um, that Tennessee is, is <laughs> just absolutely unstoppable. That It doesn't matter. You know, my favorite was uh, Desmond Howard said this on the, uh, I think it may have been the CFP ranking show, but, or no, it was on yeah. game day last week, I think where he was like, it doesn't matter if you're balanced. Like you just need to outscore the other team. Like it, it, people are saying these things. Well, and, and I mean, uh, I think the yeah. it, the misnomer yeah. about Tennessee. Yeah. Like there's a lot of narratives at play here, right? At, to your point, yeah. but like the biggest misnomer about Tennessee, in my opinion, is like that this is high flying passing offense. Nope. You know, versus Georgia defense. What's made Tennessee effective this year? Because they're running the same system they ran last year, is that you know they're they're running the ball really really well, and yep. you know they are getting up to the line after that first first down, and they're snapping it, and they're running halfback zones, you know ISO yep. up the middle kind of stuff, and they're getting five yards every time, and then yep. it's second and five, and that's dealer's choice as a play caller, and everything was on the table, and so. Yep. They're not seeing third and long situations. And that's much like we've talked about this Georgia offense all year, right? Like they're staying on schedule. When you mm -hmm. stay on schedule in college football, good things tend to happen. And it opens yeah. up a lot of options, especially, you know, you look at Tennessee when they get to midfield. It's like if it's third and five, they're going to run the ball to set up fourth and two or fourth and three and go for it, right? Like it just, mm -hmm. it just opens up a lot of options. Yeah. But, um, Correct. We've got a lot yeah. of tape to look at. Obviously, I'm yep. sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. No, the only other thing I would say too is that yeah, you to your point, um, Tennessee's running the ball. Their their rush rate versus FBS is is 57.7 percent of plays are run plays. It's more um, than so, Georgia. Yeah, that, more, yeah, Georgia is 49 point 49 point something percent, and so Georgia's 51 percent pass. And and we know that some of those uh, you know are kind of pass uh, that are essentially run plays, run designs, but you throw the ball instead of handing the ball off. But Georgia's fifty one percent pass, Tennessee fifty seven percent rush, um, and uh, and I think that's what we'll talk about a little bit today, right? If you can if you can disrupt that run game, if you can truly make Tennessee, um, I don't think you can necessarily make them one dimensional, but if you can stress them in the run game, it changes a lot about what they can and can't do um, from both a tempo standpoint, but also just um, the matchups that they're going to try to get. You you can change that a lot by just playing, playing good run defense. Absolutely. Right. Cool. You want to look at what they do? Let's do it. We're going to hop in. All right. All right. Here we go. Okay. So a lot of America got to know this Tennessee team in this Alabama game. Um, mm -hmm. So, you're going to see Hinden Hooker is a first read quarterback. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and Tennessee's done a very good job as a wide receiver core. And, and Josh Heupel is a play caller of like getting him into plays where his first read is open a lot. But mm -hmm. you're going to watch, I'm going to show you some, some stuff here. Just kind of, it's just yep. going to be a theme throughout this presentation is, is Hinden Hooker and first reads. Um, yep. Hang on one second. Wait. Yep, we got it. Yeah, we're going to uh, – hang on one second. I'm going to uh, get it from another source here. Um, apologies. Let's see. No, you're good. So, I mean, this first play we're in a – McCoy had his best game. Go for it. Uh, and cool. – <laughs> this is where producer Josh would make a make a comment about oh. the technology here. This is the we'll do it live moment um of of Dog Central. We'll do it live. Um 
All right. You good? I I'm good. All right, okay. let's go. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so you're going to see your second leading wide receiver, Brew McCoy. Uh, is going to be the first read up here, uh, top of your screen. He's got 30 catches on 43 targets this year, 451 yards. Tennessee runs a ton of these like in breaking routes and mm -hmm. it's a lot of crossers and you see Bama doesn't really play inside leverage. Uh, this is what you cannot do. Cannot do that. Yeah. Like if you, Georgia's not rushed the passer in a lot of situations this year, as much as they have tried to contain the passer and mm -hmm. the passer. Um, yep. But there's a lot. Uh, if you'll go back to that, sorry, can we go back to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure can. So, I mean, the, the point I want to make is he averages 7.1 yards in attempt, has 418 rushing yards this year. Tennessee's top two running backs mm -hmm. have 478 for 5.2 yards in attempt and 475 for 4.3. So, like, he is their most effective weapon in, in the ground game. Um, mm -hmm. He is what makes it go, especially against a talented defensive line, and you you just can't leave him lanes. You have to tackle him when he breaks contain. Uh so here you're going to see this is what Tennessee does all day. There's a lot of spots on tape in this game where UT has six blockers. Bama has seven defenders committed to the box. And Tennessee uses this fullback, H-back kind of guy to tight end. But they you see him there as well. He's lined up. And, you know, he's, he's kind of there in tight. Uh, mm hmm they're averaging 4.6 yards a carry when running between center and right guard and 4.5 yards mm -hmm. a carry when running between center and left guard. Uh, Bama gives up five yards on first and 10 over and over and over in this game. And it, and it really kind of kills them. Um, slow up for me. Oh, there you go. You're, you're good. good. Yeah. I'm just, going, I'm just going back to some of, as you're talking, I'll just go back and run some of these again and you can just talk about the concepts. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, I mean, this is that, this is a halfback ISO, right? Like right, right behind Cooper Mays, the center. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Bama has chances in this game where they get into the backfield and just don't, don't really make tackles. Uh, but, but Tennessee mm -hmm. really whips them on the line of scrimmage. I mean, like Mays gets up there, turns the, the defensive tackle mm -hmm. inside out. So I think, you know, the, that's something to obviously watch. Um, mm -hmm. If we go. And what's interesting is like on some of these as well is that they, they don't, you know, it. we're going to see when we get to, to some of these other clips, but really, you know, kind of these concepts, they're not using a ton of um, complex motions or anything like that, really. It's just you're trying to put guys, you're trying to force the defense to put players uh, in in the box, right? Like you got to, you're trying to force everybody in tight while I'm putting your wide receivers out wide and try to open up those those simple runs right there yeah and everyone talks like you, you'll see on this player right here everyone talks about how tennessee is spread mm -hmm. out to the you know all the way outside mm -hmm. the numbers to the sidelines and at times they are but like it's a little bit of a misnomer that they're spread out all the time i mean they played a lot of heavy sets against alabama and mm -hmm. bama makes a ton of leverage mistakes like yep. you see here stay right here pause where you yep. are like yep. this this guy at the bottom of the screen is going to come mm -hmm. on a little kind of inside breaking mm -hmm. route and this Bama safety. Mm -hmm. No just, leverage right there. No leverage. Yeah. Bites no. way, way outside on mm -hmm. it. It's an easy play. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to show some pit clips in a little bit where like they play, you know, pre-snap they're lined up way, way mm -hmm. with inside technique. Like we'll mm -hmm. let you go outside if you want, but we're not giving you these easy yards over the middle. Yep. And Bama didn't do that. Um, moving yeah. forward here uh, to well, after this. Yeah, there you the, go. You're going to see Bama gets a ton of pressure on Hooker. Mm -hmm. And you see him forced to step up in the pocket and he badly underthrows Hyatt. Like they don't s sack him. Like you don't, I'm sorry, you don't see Bama get a ton yeah. of pressure. Oh, are we on? Do we have 32 or no? Uh, no, I don't think we have. Yeah, we don't have 32. Okay. Sorry, well, 36. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, but my point being, like, you can affect Hooker without touching him. You mm -hmm. know, if, if you just get him off his spot, is the key. And right yep. here, 
a lot of this Tennessee offense stops being easy if your quarterback, if your defensive backs don't give away inside leverage. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, and what's interesting about Alabama is it was literally all day long. Like here, you know, here's another one where, yeah, it's just all day long. Yeah, I mean, like they're not playing inside technique, and they mm-hmm. don't fight. Like they, they don't force Hooker to make great throws. Mm-hmm. Those are mm-hmm. easy, easy, like seven on seven ass throws, <laughs> man. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, here at Cliff Forty, they run a lot of motion. If we can go back up to that, yep. Here UT you. runs a lot of motion pre-snap to try and make the defense tip its hand on whether they are in man or zone coverage, and they also do it to confuse assignments. So mm-hmm. Bama just busts the coverage on on a lot of these big plays, and it's just simple communication. Like it looks like some of the play- players, if you watch here at the top of the screen. Some of these guys are playing zone and some of them are playing man. And it doesn't seem like they know whose assignment is whose. Yep. I, I, my point being like, they're not doing anything special. Like this isn't some brilliant cutting edge scheme. Like no. these guys are just running wide yeah. ass open. Yeah. This is literally, you're just an extra guy out there to confuse them. And, the, and then that receiver just runs essentially a go route. It's just a couple steps inside and then he goes. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here you're going to see on this upcoming clip, like Hyatt is going to be in motion again, pre-snap and it's a big play for a touchdown on play action. So like, this is just UT has a heavy set. They fake a stretch zone to the left side of the formation. Hooker rolls, right? Hyatt hits the flat for a two yard catch and nobody is there as he runs it in for a score. Like that's not spread offense concepts i mean like that's you know that's a heavy set formation (laughs) this is simple this is just tennessee being like hey we feel like we can beat you to the edge with better athletes and that's what Mm -hmm. heupel did in this game and credit to him like if he finds a matchup that works he's going to go to the well over and over and over until you prove that you can't you know that you can stop it like until you make it not work they're going to continue to do it um so something to watch Another thing, as you'll see on this next clip, Tennessee beat Alabama up front in this game all day. Mm-hmm. Like, this is short yardage, me versus you, mano e mano, and that offensive line is nasty off the right side. Yeah. This was the play, by the way, where Nick Saban said, at one time Tennessee lined up in an I formation yeah. on the goal line, and my team did not know what to do. Nick Saban said that in uh, when he was talking on his coach's radio show. And you can see this is literally – it's just <laughs> its just a jumbo eye formation with one guy at the, at the top. Um, and they do nothing special, but the Alabama defense is very confused. Yeah, and I mean, like, and, you know, I, I think this is the moment where it's worth pointing out. Tennessee has scored a touchdown in every goal-to-go situation this year. If they've gotten first and goal, they have scored a touchdown. Um, and it's because, it's because they're running – plays like that in short yardage just because they're, you know, they're getting two yards when yep. they're stacking up heavy and, and it's not mm-hmm. stopping. Um, yep. So clip 95 here, Bama's interior defensive linemen are not nearly as good as George's, but they still managed to stack hooker on an interior rush here against Cooper Mays, the center number 63. Mays has been really, really good in a run, but he has not been great in, uh, in pass protection. But I mean, to give you some exi- like a some reference on how bad Alabama's defense was on this day, and how good Tennessee's offensive line was, uh, Alabama only had eight pressures against Tennessee. Florida had fifteen against them. Mm-hmm. Like it's you know that's like Florida's defensive line is not that special, right? Um, no. So it's just a, like a really bad day for Bama and a really good day for yeah. Tennessee, um, yeah. which. To their credit, they made it happen. Uh, mm-hmm. So here you're going to see a deep throw, fourth and six, and Hooker has his man, and he just misses it. And this is just to say, like, Hooker's been good this year, but he's not perfect. And, you know, 50% of his 20-plus yard throws are on target. That is the exact same mm-hmm. amount as Stetson Bennett, folks. So yeah. if you're going to go and, like, don't tell me this dude is 2019 Joe Burrow. He's not. Okay? Like, he's a yep. good – college quarterback and he's very good in in their system especially when he can follow the rules of that system but if you take away his first read 
and you make him move a little bit, things get very hairy for him. Well, on this play, too, I just wanted to rewind every second. I mean, it's fourth and six. They took away his first read, and then he throws the long ball. Right. Because, I mean, because, again, to the decision-making, it's kind of like that is not – there's a lot of – there's a lot of guys that you, you know, are hoping that uh, maybe your quarterback is thrown to him fourth and six. Now, Tennessee was up a little bit. Maybe they were going for the kill shot, but yeah, that's true. So, second and 10 here, and Bama's going to have good coverage downfield. It's a great opportunity to force a throwaway or put Tennessee into third and long and get off the field. Instead, they leave one of these inside mm-hmm. running lanes, and Hooker beats them, right? Like yep. he gets there. Now, all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's third and yeah. inches and. This goes on to be a, a touchdown drive, I believe. Yeah. So I'll also say this. I mean, there's Henry Toa Toa, right? I mean, Georgia's linebackers are faster than Henry Toa Toa. Yes. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, like when you're looking at these situations, that's one advantage that Georgia has is Hen and Hooker getting out of this situation is probably, you know, you're probably tackled after a couple yard gain versus running for 10 for a first stone. Yeah. And I mean, if we can pause for a second here, sure. like, on this play, Georgia, they'll have somebody in the spy, and that that mm-hmm. assignment will will switch around throughout the game. But a lot of times, it will be an inside linebacker, like you're saying. But like, mm-hmm. you know, the rule for that linebacker is basically like you don't move off the spot and start up field unless you know you can make a sack. Um, right. And we're going to show in a little bit. Like Hooker does struggle a little bit with delayed blitzes. Like if, mm-hmm. he's so pre-snap oriented that if you if you kind of change something up on him post-snap or give him a look that mm-hmm. he doesn't expect after the snap, then you can confuse him a little bit. So like when that lane pops up right mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. you know, if it's Smell Mondin or, or J- Dumas Johnson, like they're probably already coming up into that hole to try and sack him. Yeah. You know, correct. Well before he's I mean, at this point right here, yeah. the linebacker is beat, right? Like, he, yeah. he's two to three steps further towards the sideline than he yep. is. Yeah, he's, he's got his hips open. He's got his right foot back. Um, that's not the position that you want to be in when a quarterback has an angle right there. Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So, here, clip 128, looking at this, like, this – this isn't – I keep hearing people be like, Jalen Hyatt's so good because Josh Hyde will keep scheming him open. With This is not being schemed open with complex route patterns or rubs or whatever. Like, that happens at times. Like, this is an Alabama safety lined up in the wrong spot, and he just doesn't yep. cover the route. And yep. this, there, there isn't magic to this system. This is the yep. same system Hypel ran at Mizzou. It's the same one he ran last year. Mm-hmm. Bama just had an awful day on defense, and – People are not used to watching Alabama give up 50 points. They hadn't yep. done it since 1907, right? But, like, yep. it's not – just because that happened does not mean that there's, mm-hmm. you know, some, like, mm-hmm. magic formula that Josh Heupel has yeah. cooked up in the kitchen yep. in Knoxville that no yep. one's ever seen in college football. Yep. So, DeMarco Hellams was targeted on uh, 5% of his coverage snaps – prior to the Arkansas game, which came two before two games before Tennessee. Arkansas targeted him on 13% of his coverage snaps. Texas A&M targeted on 13% of his coverage snaps. Tennessee targeted him on 13% of his coverage snaps. So, like, three times the number of snaps he was targeted on. He had been targeted, you know, six times the entire year before the Arkansas game. So, Arkansas saw, saw something on film that then Texas A&M tried to get at him again and then Tennessee finally got at him again right I mean I think you can see that trend when you look at those targets versus receptions um and I think you know I think that's something that Georgia will definitely keep in mind this week I also think Georgia's safeties are much better in coverage and and faster than DeMarco Holmes they are yeah they 100% are um so looking here at clip 150 uh I mean this is just this isn't like heavy, heavy pressure, but it's enough pressure to affect, yeah, to affect this throw. And Hooker, yeah, I just want to point out he only has a fifty-eight and a half percent adjusted completion percentage on ten to nineteen mm-hmm. yard throws. Um, 
so if you're Georgia, you want to put him in a situation where it's third down and he's having to make 10 to 19 yard throws, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get first downs. Uh, Cause that that's not really his comfort zone. He's Correct. a good deep ball thrower. He's good, you know, intermediate, or I'm sorry, short throws, but that intermediate range 10 to 19, that's where he's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And that's 58 and a half percent adjusted completion. So that is, that's bumping up his completion percentage for any on target throw that was a drop or, you know, should have been caught or whatever. Hmm. Um, all right. So next clip here, Hyatt, I mean, he scored five touchdowns in this game and there's so many deep balls on tape hmm. that teams tend to play him soft and it creates hmm. some easy opportunities for him to work comeback routes in the slot. He's in the slot over 85% of the time. You know, you, you saw him on the boundary, some here but like this is where he plays and he's just going to go to the sticks and turn around and you know it's a nice execution it's a nice timing route but again that is the first read hooker mm -hmm. is sitting there staring at him the entire time you have to you have to make hooker go to his second read um you know I, you're not gonna be able to do it every down of course but like if georgia can make him go to his second read on half of his throws in this game i think that it will dramatically affect the outcome of this football game. Correct. So clip 160, um, <laughs> Bama just lets the same guy run free on the back end over and over and over. And it's astounding how bad they were in coverage with Hyatt. Uh, Christopher Smith, Malachi Starks have been way better than this as safeties to the point you were just making shortly ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the year, Hyatt, 48 catches on 55 targets, man. Like, He's a very efficient receiver. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, all right. So how do we stop Tennessee? How do you stop Tennessee? We're going to look at the Pittsburgh tape because they did a very good job of it. Um, Pitt Pittsburgh. Yeah. So Pittsburgh held Tennessee at 27 in regulation. Yep. Held them to three points in the second half. I think for those, for, for folks, you know, tuning in who missed it, um, uh, and they did that mostly by the play of their interior defensive line. I mean, their interior defensive line played really, really well um, and and kind of, you know, helped shutter that run game that, we'll, that we talked about earlier. So, cool. Yeah, for sure. There you go. Ready for clip 13? I am. All right. All right. So – Take away Hooker's first read. What have we been talking about this whole time? Uh, against Pitt, you'll see him play an interior defensive line that he actually fears and respects. Pittsburgh had 19 pressures against the Tennessee offensive line, and when Hooker looks downfield right here, he doesn't see his first read open. He immediately puts his head down after a couple seconds. Pitt's DL is there. Like They didn't try to sack him in a lot of situations. They tried to be waiting <laughs> with open arms mm -hmm. when he tried to step up. Mm -hmm. And oh. – but I think, like, you know, Alabama, uh, LSU to a certain extent, like a lot of teams never made Hooker uncomfortable because mm -hmm. the way to make Hooker uncomfortable is not really edge rushers, in my opinion. The way to make him uncomfortable is coming up the middle, and there's just not many teams in college football that have elite pass rushing defensive tackles or, you know, inside linebackers, and mm -hmm. Georgia does. Um so moving on, this is going to be the very next play in this game. Third and 10, Pitt brings six pass rushers. Hmm. They bring an extra rusher off each edge. Their defensive tackles collapse onto Hooker when he steps up into the pocket. Once again, they cover the first read, and he doesn't yep. get the ball out. He doesn't know where to go. Um, and the point of this is, like, if you play scared against Tennessee, you're, you'll create scary situations for yourself. Mm -hmm. Bama – you know, they set in a lot of three-man fronts and, and you know, rushed threes, and they got picked apart. It was a lot like, like Georgia when they played Alabama in the SEC Championship game last year. Like, you got to force the issue. And if you get burnt once or twice, you take, take your chance. But right there, like, yep. on some of Tennessee's explosive pass plays against Alabama, their wide receivers have 12, 15 yards of cushion for free releases. Pittsburgh mans up on the outside, and – they play physical press coverage, and their DBs always had inside leverage. They press these outside receivers into the boundaries, and they make Hendon Hooker throw perfect passes down the sideline. 
And this is a tough throw. I mean, Hendon Hooker is a good quarterback, but this is a tough throw from any quarterback. You're you're trying to, you know, throw it over a DB on the inside 50 yards down the field. So. Yeah, and that's Cedric Tillman, right? Like he's, you yeah. know, going into the season, he was the guy that everyone thought was Tennessee's best wide receiver. Mm-hmm. And that, that DB is step for step with him. But, I mean, the, the point is like this game plan that Pitt ran right here with these press coverage, mm-hmm. like instead of – Hooker being a 50% completion quarterback on 20 plus yard throws, he drops down to three of 10. You know, Mm -hmm. that 20% is a large amount of variance. He still had two touchdowns on throws over 20 yards, but, you know, three completions versus five on those deep shots Mm -hmm. can, can be the difference in a football game in a lot of cases. Yeah. Especially with as explosive as Tennessee is, right? Like, you know, you, you keep you press them to the outside you force them in completions it puts them in some tough situations where um, they do try to create those explosive plays and and i think georgia i think georgia's going to sell out and try to stop those explosive plays i think georgia's going to try to force tennessee you know i think you you may see those those underneath intermediate throws where tennessee's moving the ball a little bit maybe getting down and condensing the field a little bit in some places too yeah and i mean the other thing i want to point out is that this this playing inside leverage, I'm going to show you guys a, a very good example of it here momentarily. But but that game plan, mm-hmm. it, you know, those 10, 20-plus yard attempts we're talking about, eight of them went outside the numbers in this game. Mm-hmm. And only two were in between the hashes, and neither of those were completions. And you go back and watch that Bama tape we were just watching, Hyatt's streaking down the middle of the field <laughs> over the, and over and over. Yeah, the Bama tape, you have uh, Jalen Hyatt on – mismatched on a safety that doesn't run super well outside the numbers. I mean, I'm sorry, inside the numbers uh, for an easy, easy throws. And that's going to, you're going to get beat every time playing that game with Tennessee. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, so clip 23, you see how I pull run the ball a lot around midfield when the balls are facing third and mediums and Pittsburgh's ready for it, right? They know it's coming. They jump in here. They, you know, they get low, they jump into this hole, they're ready for this inside run. And that's not unusual. Like they know that it's ready when it when it's handed off, but Pitt just whips them at the line of scrimmage and stops this. And now you're fourth and you know, fourth and four, fourth and three, which we've got the very next clip we'll show you is gonna be this fourth and three. And I want to watch this pre-snap really carefully here because Tennessee gets to the line of scrimmage quickly and they motion like they always do. Like we talked about this earlier, they're going to motion guys around and they're going to see that Pittsburgh is in man coverage and they go double slants. Watch the inside leverage here. So Hmm. hooker wants to play the slot receiver in the slant, the guy at the bottom of your screen in the bottom of our frame right now. And this defensive back is shading inside Hmm. and he's, you know, the linebackers stepped out. He doesn't have that throw. He has to go to the longer throw on the, Hmm outside slant to Cedric Tillman and you know it's a it's a tight window Mm -hmm. and it's it's incomplete right so it's like just take away those easy middle of the field throws those first reads and a lot of good things happen Mm -hmm. um clip 31 so Tennessee gets six yards on first down at second and four they hurry to the line and Pitt knows what's coming right inside zone run like it's it's very they they it's not that hard to tell when they're about to run this play, especially when you see that H back lined up in there tight, and their DCs just jump the gaps and blow it up for no game, and it's the type of thing that Jalen Carter, Warren Brinson, Bear Alexander, Tyron Ingram, Dawkins, etc., should be able to to do in a lot of situations. Mm-hmm. Um, coming up here, clip eighty nine. Pitt does not let Hooker sit back and pick them apart, as we were talking about earlier. Like they force the issue and they blitz them. And uh, here you see a delayed blitz where, you know, this this inside linebacker is going to take off. No. And it's just, you know, Georgia and, and, Georgia does a lot of this, right? Like Georgia does a lot of these uh, yes. delayed twists where you have a linebacker coming from one side, delaying, letting the other linebacker come in between and trying to trying to loop around. So, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, they love to 
you know, they love to let the quarterback see, you know, see the front seven at the snap Mm -hmm. and read that, you know, that guy's not blitzing and then let him blitz. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like Pittsburgh stopped Tennessee on early downs, put them into third and long. And once they were there, Pitt brought pass rushers and let its secondary sit back towards the first down marker. And now, you know, this is a third and 15, but even on third and tens, you see this in the game. Hooker didn't have windows to throw into at the sticks, and Pitt's defense was sitting there waiting to jump the routes, you know, around the first down marker. And by the time those wide receivers were going to clear open further downfield, he's he's getting pressured. He's getting sacked, you know. So yep. he's there's not time for a 30-yard pass because those defensive yep. linemen and linebackers are, are there. Yeah. And in this replay, you see the leverage again, you know, the safety, right? So you're, you're, the receiver gets inside and the safety immediately comes over and tries to <laughs> squeeze that window. Just yeah. squeezing, squeezing. No, I mean, you can, like, all over this game, there are plays where, you know, mm-hmm. if the linebacker, I'm sorry, if, like, if Tennessee's wide receiver is a lot, like, their slot receiver, let's say he's standing on the hash mark, lining mm-hmm. up, the, the pit defensive back is a yard and a half inside the hash mark. And mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, dude, you can you can go out there if you want. And there are times where Tennessee does like they run a corner route or they run like a mm-hmm. a little seven yard out route, but make him make the longer throw, you know, like make him read the second guy, make him make the play that takes longer to develop and gives your your pass rushers more of a chance to get there. Just just take away the easiest thing on the field and then see what happens. Clip 25. Yeah, so we're going to look at – yeah, we're going to look at Tennessee's defense now. And uh, Bama had a lot of success. I'm sorry, what's up? Oh, no, no, you're you're good. Yeah, Bama had a lot of success working across the field on long crossers against man coverage. Mm -hmm. Um, They pick on the safety, number zero. Oh, I must have marked the wrong play there. That's right. But – okay all right so stay out of third and long against tennessee right they're just going to tee off on blitzes they go wide open sell out like just like we're talking about pittsburgh forcing the issue on them like they they force the issue a lot you know and and they don't have a great secondary and so like that's a big part of this game for georgia is blitz pick up by the offensive line and the running backs and then also you know as as is the case in every football game staying out Mm -hmm. of third and seven plus yeah. If they can do the, that, they'll be fine. Yeah. And this is a situation too. I mean, if Georgia finds themselves third and 22 inside the two, <laughs> their own two, yeah. um, it's just not a high, high percentage. Yeah. Situation. And going back and looking at this game, man, there's so many uh, drives that like start and Tennessee's checkerboard end zone is in the, the, mm-hmm. the television frame. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Bama's backed yeah. up inside the 10, 20, inside the 15. So, yeah. Um, Bama's OL isn't great, but they made some nice creases on the interior at times against this defense. Uh, inside mm-hmm. linebacker number 10, Jawan Mitchell misplays the run fit, comes down into the mm-hmm. wrong hole, and he's got a missed tackle percentage of 14.3% on run plays. He misses some plays. And then the safety who makes the tackle, number one, Trayvon Flowers, mm-hmm. he hesitates a bit. And Flowers misses tackles 28% of the time in run defense. So, like, this play is not a missed tackle, but he's just not a great run defender. And so this is maybe a 10-yard gain when it could have been, like, a 7-yard gain against a safety that's just a little bit better at at reading and playing the run. So Mm -hmm. something to watch. I think there's opportunity for Georgia to break long explosive runs in this game because those those safeties and and linebackers are not – always the most consistent tackling the run at the second level. Mm-hmm. Um, so here you've got the best tight end that Tennessee has faced all year was, was Cameron Latu. Uh, had six receptions on eight targets for 90 yards in this game. And Bama was able to work him really well on e- intermediate throws, like the, the average depth of target on these throws to him on those mm-hmm. eight throws was, was nine yards. So these are chain mover type of plays. Um, I know a team that has a lot of tight ends. You might have heard of them, <laughs> and we've and we've seen this very thing a lot from those tight ends, Darnell Washington especially, where 
you're just sitting down in space mm-hmm. with, with a lot of people uh, far away from you. Yeah, and I expect Georgia to um, use those guys in the slot more mm-hmm. on Saturday than they have this year so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, clip 60 here. Uh, Bama had a lot of success off the left side of their offensive line. Tennessee really struggled on runs where uh, Jameer Gibbs could kind of cut back or like, you know, these these stretch plays where the back takes off heading towards the wide side. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I mean, Gibbs is a really good back. Don't get me wrong. Like that's, you know, not just an average running play, but like those are, those are cuts that Kenny Mack makes in, it, in a lot Dejan of Edwards as well. Like that's yeah. a very, you know, Dejan Edwards definitely has that style too. For sure. And this next play, you're just going to see uh, the Vols show a blitz a lot when the opponent is inside the 10. Sometimes they rush, but other times they'll drop back and get their hands up. So it's it's important to be able to run the ball in the red zone Mm -hmm. to keep Tennessee from making you one-dimensional and kind of dictating this, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's just a lot for a quarterback to have to pick up when the field has shrunk down that that small. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that's a lot of this game for both sides is, is who can run the ball in the red zone. Um, mm-hmm. I think both teams can move the ball between the twenties pretty well. So uh, clip 74, you're going to see Bama had a lot of success throwing to the halfbacks out of the backfield. And it wasn't so much like swing passes as it is like checkdowns and plays where the halfback sneaks out on a delayed route. Uh, Bama's running backs, 10 targets for eight catches and 70 yards in this game. Again, like those are chain mover type plays. Um, Georgia loves to toss it to the running backs as well. I think that's, you know, Tennessee plays a lot of zone coverage on the back end, kind of, you know, tries to keep things in front of them. And so a lot of times Bama would just let their wide receivers clear deep and Tennessee, their, their defensive backs would go with them. And then you flip it to Gibbs and it's easy 15 yards down the boundary. Uh, Here you're going to see Alabama, was talking earlier, they hit a lot of deep crossing routes against Tennessee. And these are concepts that Georgia uses a lot. You've seen a lot of these, this kind of exact same throw from Bennett to Roseme on third downs over the last four to six weeks, third and long situations. But yeah, these, these kind of deep in routes and and some of this is just, you know, flood variations um, overloading one side of the field with receivers and, and having them, break at different route uh, at different uh i'm sorry depths um bama did a lot of it georgia will too and they had a lot of success with it um worth noting that tennessee did have 25 pressures against alabama in this game like mm. their defensive line teed off and a lot of it is because i mean look at this you know you got a bunch of dudes that are about to go right here mm-hmm. um Bama's going to target Latu right here on a quarter route, and he's lined up as an inline tight end is what I want to point out. Like, he's lined up like he's he's going to block, and he just gets out of that three-point stance and blows past that linebacker. Um, the linebacker is Jeremy Banks, number 33, the one that's in coverage on Latu. Uh, three targets in that game, gave up three catches for 48 yards. So, Georgia with the inlines of Bowers and then even more so Washington – they get lined up on these Tennessee linebackers like that. That's a matchup that they're going to hunt all day because these linebackers, even by linebacker standards, are not very good in coverage. Um, you see here, number one, Trayvon Flowers, that same safety we were talking about earlier, struggling in run support. He misses this tackle in the open field. Doesn't really even come close. And misses badly. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, bad angle, bad form toast yeah and i mean the other thing to point out is just some of that one bama again running off the left side of their offensive line into the right side of tennessee's defensive line like that seemed to be the the pain point for tennessee's defense in this game i think georgia's offensive line is better across the front than than bama's is i think they'll have matchups they like almost everywhere but Yeah. yeah um so this next clip, you're going to see uh, defensive back number 12 to Marion McDonald, and he just gets hit on a little slant pattern right there. But uh, he's a guy that Georgia, I think, can have a lot of success on in this game. He's given up 32 catches on just 40 targets this year. 
Uh, only 254 yards given up on those 32 catches. So it's not like he's busting, you know, 60 yard plays over and over. But mm-hmm. Georgia, what, what what Georgia wants to do in this game is be efficient. They don't want to be mm-hmm. explosive. You know what I mean? Like, right. if an explosive play comes, that's great. You take it and you you take the seven points and move on. But what Georgia wants to do is go on, you know, four or five, six minute drives and yep. you know have 12 yard runs and 16 yard passes, not 70 and 80. Correct. I think you're going to see a lot of this and a lot of this as well. Um, versus yes. Tennessee this weekend, just those, those quick, you know, kind of quick game screens where you just get it out to a guy. And the whole goal is to put yourself in second and short. Yeah. And, and that's McDonald run, right there that misses yeah. that tackle as well. Yeah. All right, just a couple plays left. Yeah. 167 is the next clip. So Byron Young, number six, is Tennessee's best pass rusher. He's got a really cool story. He was working at Dollar General a few years ago. He's an easy kid to pull for. Uh, Comes free on a lot of downs against Alabama. Here he's coming off the bottom of the screen. He's going to just be virtually unblocked. He's the one that's standing up at the bottom of the line. Um He's this be- He's our best pass rusher. He's got 33 pressures on the year, leads the team. The guy that actually makes the sack is going to be number 21, Amari Thomas. He's an interior lineman. Uh, he has 13 pressures on the season, third most on the team. He's kind of their best interior pass rusher. Not a guy that really terrifies you if you're Georgia with, with Van mm-hmm. Pran and the guards you have. But Byron Young is interesting because he's – if, if they get pressure, normally he's the engine, you know what I mean? Like he's the guy that's forcing, forcing the issue and, and, you know, moving the quarterback into somebody else who's making the, the sack eventually, but he's really bad against the run. He's, mm-hmm. I think he's actually Tennessee's lowest graded run defender. I know he's their lowest graded run defender among the starters. PFF has him as like a 41.7 run defense grade, if I'm not mistaken. So Tennessee's going to have to, balance out like do we want his pass rushing prowess on the field and are we just going to deal with taking the hits when when georgia lines up to run the ball at him Mm -hmm. um next play so tennessee will bust some coverages of their own guys uh fourth quarter play (laughs) they just let jojo earl run totally unguarded down the sideline for a huge gain it's second and 24 nobody's home um i mean nobody's close it was no (laughs) <laughs> not at all and like i think one thing i want to point out is yes i do think georgia wants to go on long drives in this game but like i think there will be a point in this game where georgia goes tempo mm-hmm. just to kind of mess with tennessee a little bit and you know make them look at something different and when they do tennessee doesn't always handle that super well you know they, they get confused mm-hmm. like you see there so Mm-hmm. something to watch um and then the last play like pit pit's running back is just gonna absolutely gash this defense right here for a he's just gonna house like a 76 yard touchdown <laughs> um, you know so i'm just saying yes yeah, like tennessee has gotten better in a lot of aspects over the course of the season but like there's still a 31 percent blue chip ratio of football team yeah. And Georgia's still a 79% blue chip ratio football team. Well, and you see it right here with the tackling. I mean, it's just atrocious one. Here's Trayvon Flowers just doing nothing. It's pretty tough. Yeah, that is tough. All right, Graham, what are your – what are your, your – summarize oh. this for the people. Uh. So what I see in Tennessee is an offense that's been like, they've been good. Um, You know, going into that Alabama game, I think they had like an 88% success rate in the red zone. And, you know, they were very successful in the red zone that day against Alabama, but that's come down a little bit since they kicked a lot of field goals against LSU, despite their average starting field position being like, I think their own 45 in that game, um, mm-hmm. you know, against Kentucky last week, they, they kicked a lot of field goals. If they get first and goal so far this year, they've scored touchdowns, but they haven't been really great in between the 20 and the 10 lately. 
I think that they can move the ball on Georgia. They moved the ball on Georgia last year. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's kind of the, I think it's a similar kind of story to what Georgia did against Alabama and Indianapolis, right? Like it's red zone roulette a little bit of, Mm -hmm. we're going to get down there and we trust ourselves to, to beat you when the field shrinks. And, you know, I think Georgia, as much talk has been had around like the secondary and the experience that was lost, like, you know, Kendrick's not here anymore. Lewisine is not there anymore, but I think on the whole across the back end, this is a better covering secondary than the one Georgia had last year. Like, Mm -hmm. I, you know, we all love Lewisine. It's a great play for Georgia, but Starks is a better cover safety than, than scene was, um, you know, seen a lot of other things better, but we're talking about pure coverage skills. Yeah. Stark is that dude. Uh, I, I think the, the big matchup in this game is Javon Bullard versus Jalen Hyatt, right? Mm-hmm. In that slot. And you'll probably see some Tyke Smith out there as well. Uh, yep. I really like Bullard's agility. Like Bullard is fast. You know, Bullard cuts well. And I think, you know, Bullard is exactly the type of dude that's just a dog to run a slant against, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you don't want to have to do it over and over. And so I think Georgia can make things tough on Tennessee. Um, At the end of the day, this game comes down to which of these teams is going to stop the run better, right? Mm -hmm. And there's there's been so much talk about great offense in Tennessee versus great defense in Georgia. And there hasn't been much talk about great offense in Georgia, number two in total yardage, number two in passing yards a game, yada, 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 against really bad – not really bad, but, like, not a great defense in Tennessee. Tennessee's not a great defensive team. I think they've gotten better over the last few weeks, but a lot of what's made them good lately is they have had license to be as aggressive as they want to be because they know they're going to score points. And I think, like, if Georgia – is holding Tennessee to field goals in the red zone or fourth down attempts in the red zone, or, you know, there's going to be some three and outs for Tennessee in this game. Like if Georgia's stopping that run and making Hendon hooker beat them and making him throw the ball 40, 45, maybe 50 yeah. dropbacks in this game. Like that's just a big ass from Tennessee. And I think like Tennessee all of a sudden has to kind of yeah. question their own defensive philosophy. So, yeah, I know if Tennessee's gotten better on defense, right? I mean, they played, they, they gave 49 to Alabama and almost 600 yards, and then they played UT Martin, and then they played Kentucky. And versus Kentucky, they had Kentucky at home. They scored early, and Kentucky came down. I think it was like a seven to six game or something. Then Tennessee scored a couple of times and put, put Kentucky in a situation where they had to throw the ball. Will Levis slinging it all over the place, and, and he threw interceptions, right? And so, yeah. I'm interested. I think what what is what is valid is against versus Kentucky, right? Is they were able to put them in situations where they ran a lot of that pressure you were talking about when you were showing some of the Alabama tape. Um, I mean, Tennessee, mm-hmm. they will get you in situations where, um, you know, your backs a- against the wall, and if you let them go out there and score and get a couple score lead, I think that's the challenge for Georgia this week is putting Tennessee's defense in a position where they um, have to really think about um, pressure in the quarterback versus stopping the run versus defending um, the intermediary, you know, to long throws. Like, I think that that's, you, you have those three kind of pieces. And if you can get it in a game where if the, if the game stays tight, if Georgia gets a little bit of a lead, um, and you can, and you're really running an efficient offense. Like I think that Tennessee defense, you're going to neutralize um, the stuff. The I'll say it this way because I've just been salty this week. But you're going to neutralize the very few things that they do well. <laughs> yeah, you know, right? I mean, they don't yeah. do that much. They don't do that very. They don't do many things well. Um, what I'm interested in is Georgia. I Georgia is going to. Um, run a scheme to prevent the explosive plays. I think Georgia is going to be in a situation where they are not going to – I don't think Glenn Schumann and Will Muschamp are going to put the secondary in a situation or linebackers in a situation where they're getting beat deep for these, you know, Jalen Hyatt streaking down the field for a touchdown. 
Right. And so what what I do think is that, you know, if Georgia can stop the run, I think this might be a moot point as well. But if Tennessee gets down in the red zone or gets down inside the 30, I'm really interested to see that Georgia red zone defense versus the Tennessee red zone offense. Because Georgia is is second uh, or third in the country. They're third in the country in – uh, versus FBS and defensive red zone scoring percentage. So they're only allowing 64% of scores in the red zone. Um, and, uh, and Tennessee's scoring 100% of the time and scoring touchdowns 100% of the time. So I think that's going to be a really interesting thing to watch. Um, and uh, I think it's I, – I, I think the key for me is we just looked at a lot of film. I think Kirby Smart – Will Muschamp, Glenn Schumann, Fran Brown, Trey Scott. They've had that they've had the Alabama film for three weeks. Yeah. And so they've had the pit film for however long they've had the pit film, right? And so um I think when you look at that, I I I do I'm excited to see this game because I do think Josh Heupel is is going to bring his absolute best that he can. And I think Georgia's uh, Kirby Smart and that defensive squad is going to bring the best too, and I think um, we're going to see what happens. Yeah, I agree, and I mean, I, I think you know if you look back on this game last year, mm-hmm. I, I guess what the thing I want to say is like <laughs> Georgia. Maybe the best thing that happened for Georgia going into this game was kind of having that weird third quarter last week where mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you know, oh my God, this thing swung really hard and we got to go answer. And you go 78 yards in six plays, five of those on mm-hmm. the ground. And it's just like, I think that Georgia has the ability to be a little more varied in this game. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, I think that this offense I've like, I've seen like Jordan Rodgers get on, television or Twitter this week and say, you know, Georgia hasn't had a wide receiver with a a pass reception, I think over 30 yards and 27 quarters, which is true. I mean, Brock Bowers had a 70 yard touchdown catch last week, but like, you know, he is, he is not a wide receiver. Yeah. But like, again, we were kind of talking about this when we were going through tape, like that's not really what you want to do in this game. But I think if you need to do it, Mm -hmm. it's there. And I think a huge advantage for Georgia is that they have not had to really show much of anything this year to get to this point eight and up. And Tennessee had to empty the clip against Alabama to to get out of that game alive. Mm -hmm. And Georgia, you know, is is kind of cruised. They had some adversity against Missouri, but like they never, you know, pulled any like Mocken never had to pull anything out of his back pocket in that game that that we hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I mean, if you're a Duck Central subscriber, you already know this, but there are some wrinkles that we have not seen before that I know Georgia has been working on this week. We're not going to give them away and, you know, screw the pooch and be hated forever. <laughs> but, like, yeah, they sound good to me. I mean, I'm always yeah, oh, coordinator. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. Like, Listen, if people think – so I will say this. Georgia came out against Florida 28-3 to at halftime, and then Georgia – you know, I, I candidly, I believe Georgia took the foot off the gas in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. I believe, you know, th- there was a Kenny McIntosh fumbled, which was, you know, kind of that immediate turnover. Um, but I think, you know, especially on the defensive th- side of the ball, I, I, I won't, I, I think Georgia was intentionally trying to wind that game down a little bit to try to, ex- you know, hurry the game up, get it over with. And this game, if you think that <laughs> uh, that Georgia has, you know, if you think the defense, the defensive scheme, pressure packages, et cetera, that Georgia has shown these last four or five weeks uh, are what Georgia has in a tank, you're incredibly wrong. If right. you think on offense, uh, uh, the scheme, the formations, uh, that Georgia has shown these last four or five weeks that that's what they have in the tank, you're absolutely wrong. And what Georgia showed and what I have a lot of confidence in is Georgia showed when when they set some through an interception and Kenny McIntosh fumbled and Florida got back in the game, it's 28 to 20. Georgia just flipped the switch like, oh, oh, we still have to play. Okay, 
and they immediately <laughs> went down two touchdown drives and just stuck it right to Florida and and the defense immediately tightened up and you know Tennessee uh, is is a much better team than Florida but I still think Georgia to your point had to show a lot I mean all they did was just was just flex their will and um and I think there are some wrinkles we know that there are some wrinkles that Georgia's been working on from our from the practice intel on Doc, Doc Central but and getting but I also think um this is how seasons go right you install in the off season you go through fall camp you add stuff you work on stuff you go through this progression to get to games like this and georgia is very fortunate that tennessee had a game that went to overtime with pitt had to go to LSU, and you know, I, I do think Tennessee showed uh, some some stuff at LSU because they were trying to really win that game. Really had to empty a lot of the clip versus Alabama to just win the game, yeah. and um, and Georgia has absolutely not had to do that. Well, and I, you know, we coined this show last year, or I'm sorry, we coined the term on the show last year, mocking crumbs, right? And that, that's basically <laughs> like. You know, these little things that you yep. would pick up in a game, get, like in an ass beating against Samford or something like, mm -hmm. like, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Like they put Darnell Washington out there and, you know, yeah. threw him a, a 12 yard <laughs> comeback route and it looked undefendable. They could do that whenever yeah. they want, but they don't need mm -hmm. to. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, like, I think Georgia has more bullets in the clip. So, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, I do think that Tennessee's wide receivers are, are good and talented. Like they're going to make some plays. They're going to move the ball. But like a lot of this game to me is just a, who gets to halftime, you know, like if Georgia can get to halftime and Tennessee's only, you know, like run 30 to 40 plays, they're in a very good spot, right? Like Tennessee wants to run a hundred plays on Saturday, at least 90. Yep. And I think that Georgia can, you know, get enough run game stops and bother Hooker enough to get them off the field. And the the underrated side of this is just like if you look at this game last year, Georgia played, you know, they kind of played Tennessee style in a lot of ways. The longest the longest drive that Georgia had against Tennessee last year was under four minutes mm -hmm. and they won this game 41 to 17 it was 41 to 10 really between the, the two first teams they, they gave up a garbage time touchdown but like my point being is this team is better than last year but it's not that much different than last year you're not seeing something new and you know Channing Tindall really feasted on Tennessee in this game last year because Yep. He can move like a rocket ship and, you know, yep. he, he closed on a lot of those, like, like, you know, Georgia was spying hooker. Mm -hmm. And as soon as hooker moved off his spot, he'd come in and clean that up. I think he had three sacks in this game mm -hmm. a year ago, but Georgia still has those types of athletes. Like, like they don't have the guys that they had last year, but like, this is still a team that has future pros on every level. And there's a part of me that like the, just the sheer principle, of this is if Tennessee wins this game, they're going to the college football playoff, right? Mm -hmm. And the 2019 LSU comparison, they're going to continue and all of that. And like 2019 LSU had the fifth most talented roster in college football, according yes. to the 24-7 the talent composite. Tennessee right now has the 19th most talented. Now, yes. they've got some guys that are surprises. They have, you know, they've had some good transfer stuff happen and all that but that, that's also accounting for transfer uh re-ratings yeah. and all that but just my point is like i don't think people realize just kind of how much talent is left on this georgia defense and, and how mm -hmm. different it is than what tennessee's gone up against to this point we talked earlier yeah. like pittsburgh is probably the closest thing they've seen to georgia from a defensive line standpoint but Pittsburgh had two of those guys get hurt during that game, two of their, you know, mm -hmm. interior linemen, and, and it hurt them a lot. Like, yep. Georgia has waves and waves of those guys, and 
I know this game has been on the minds of the staff going back to fall camp. They worked on some Correct. of this stuff during the bye week before Florida. Like, yeah. I, I when you look at Georgia's schedule, so I think this is important for people to understand. Kirby has said. Kirby has said. You've heard. You've heard him if you watch his press conference. He said that they've been working on this since fall camp. He said they've done two things. They worked on tempo, and they've conditioned more than they probably have in years past. Like he, Kirk, Kirby Smart. Georgia started a couple of years ago preparing for these tempo offenses by conditioning like hell. These guys, like they, their their goal is not only to get, you know, that first unit in as best shape as possible, but go, you know, three, four deep where those guys are, are in good shape when they get on the field. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we as fans and, and, and analysts and, and, you know, media, all the other stuff looked at Tennessee and probably said, Oh, well that, you know, maybe Tennessee is an eight or nine win team this year. And maybe they take a step forward, but you know, uh, but, but they're probably not going to compete for the S they're, they're definitely not going to compete for the college football playoff. I think that was a lot of the narrative around Tennessee. I don't think that thought ever entered the mind <laughs> of Kirby Smart and Will Musch. Yeah. I think they looked they looked at the SEC East and I think they said Tennessee is probably the best cont- out of the That's right. the roster. Yeah. Uh, because because of what Tennessee was able to do last year in some games and the tempo that that offense plays and and just the talent of the wide receivers in particular I think you probably look at and say man they they may have the bigger core to start the year in the SEC. And so the the staff has definitely been preparing for this game, and I think um, I, I just think you, you recruit at the level that Georgia recruits for games like this, um, and folks can compare Alabama. I don't to me Alabama's defense. Their defensive line is not as good. Their linebackers are not as good. Um, their coaches their head, are not as good. Their coaches are not as good. Their like secondary, that, yeah, is definitely that's not what as good. that game came down to. Yeah, I mean Terry, Terry and Arnold, like again, not to pick on these guys. These are these are players, you know, whatever. But like you've got you've got guys in the second that are no longer getting a rest <laughs> right on the Alabama defense. Yeah. And no one can convince me that you know Georgia uh, can't go uh, three or four deep in the secondary if they need to. With guys like Dalen Everett and and some of those guys uh, can get on the field and run with these Tennessee wide receivers if there's a breakdown somewhere. I agree, and I think. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, man. I just yeah. – you and I are guilty of this. We've just done this for the last 15 minutes. But, yeah. like, everyone is really kind of, I think, messed up the calculus on this of this is Tennessee's offense versus Georgia's defense. And it's not. Correct. Like, it, it's both, not. both sides of the ball got to play. And Georgia mm-hmm. – I think Tennessee's offense and Georgia's defense is a, a really mm-hmm. good matchup. Mm-hmm. But I think Georgia can get them to that, that kind of like that sticking point, you know, mm-hmm. where yeah. they they make them one dimensional in a lot of situations, and they force Booker to beat them in a lot of third and longs. And yep. I think he's a good player, but there's just that's just not a, a recipe for winning football. I, and I think Georgia will stay on schedule. And I think I think I think Georgia's defense has a much better chance of making Tennessee's offense one dimensional yeah. than Tennessee's Correct. defense has of making Georgia's offense one dimensional. Correct. I think I think Georgia's going to score in the forties. Um, I agree. And, and and I don't I don't see any way that Tennessee stops them. Even with Georgia being efficient, I you know and 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 running some clock and those types of things, I think Georgia's going to score in the forties. Um, and I think the question is, you know, do you believe that Tennessee can come back to that well and score, you know, a, a 40 or a 50 burger again in Sanford Stadium versus this defense? Um, and uh, and I don't think Georgia's going to have to outscore Tennessee. I don't think Georgia's going to get into a game where they're going blow for blow, touchdown for touchdown versus Tennessee. But if they do get in that situation, I trust Georgia's offense versus Tennessee more than I trust Tennessee offense versus Georgia's defense to make a play. Like you know what I mean? At some point, that's blow for blow. Somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna, uh, one of the defenses is gonna 
to make a stop at some point, um, unless you're Alabama and Tennessee. Uh, but uh, well, I just but well, I, I trust I trust Georgia's defense to make a stop. I'll and, put it and, this uh, way: yeah. as bad as Tennessee, as bad as Alabama's defense played that day against Tennessee, yeah. for Tennessee to get to 52 in that game required a muff punt where they took the ball over. You know, I think at like the mm-hmm. the 30, and then you know. 17 penalties for 150 yards or 140 yep. something yards. Tennessee's average touchdown drive this year is, is I believe 68 yards or it mm-hmm. was before last week when they had all the short fields against Kentucky. So that's, that's basically a gift of 21 points yep. as bad as Correct. Alabama's displayed that day. Correct. You know, they're, they still like, I don't know the way that the Tennessee, you know, if this is 2019 LSU, then they should have dropped 70 on their asses. Right. Like I, I, I know that's, that's it's, hyperbole and I'm joking but, a little yeah. bit, but I'm also trying to make the point of like, they're really good, but there's also like a, a lot of variance in the system that they run. And yeah. if you, if you beat them at the line of scrimmage, this mm-hmm. is like as much as they spread everything out, and create speed advantages and, and the tempo and all that. Like football is still this is still SEC football and it's still it's still one on the line of scrimmage. And I think Georgia's Absolutely. defensive line outmatches Tennessee's offensive line. I think Georgia's offensive line really outmatches Tennessee's defensive line. So correct. I all right. Score score predictions. You go shoot. All right. I I think um I I think Georgia I think Tennessee is going to come out. I think it'll be a similar game to last year where Tennessee is going to have some success um, early in the game. Uh, Georgia is going to find a package. If you remember last year, Latavius Brini came off the field. Chris Smith got put in the star position. You had Channing Tindall get uh, playing some edge with Adam Anderson out. You know, many points in that game, you had Tindall and Nicobe Dean in the game together. Um, I think Tennessee is going to have a little success early. I think Georgia is going to have a lot of success early. I think it will seem like, you know, maybe in that first uh, first quarter that it's a blow for blow type game, and then I think the adjustments are going to come. I think Kirby uh, Smart, Will Muschamp, Glenn Schumann are going to find the personnel that they need to find to put in position, uh, find ways to rotate guys even with that tempo, get a few stops, and I think this ends up being uh, a 41 to 27 kind of game is going to be my prediction. I see 41 to 30 maybe, but but I think it's going to be a 41 to 27 type of game. And I think um, the second half in particular, I think Tennessee, it, it's going to feel – I think Tennessee may have – you know, they may have a, a drive or they may have a couple of uh, explosive plays, but I do think it's going to feel much more like – Tennessee versus Pitt in the second half than Tennessee versus Alabama in the second half. I think the crowd's going to be a huge factor. So I'm going 41 to 27 is, uh, is going to be my official score prediction. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at Georgia, uh, you just talked about it, like kind of some of the, the combinations that they found last year to take care of, can you hear my dog barking in the background? I, yeah, I love it. It's perfect. It's perfect. Omens. Omens. Yeah, it this is happened, omen. hey, this happened it's, before the national title it, game show last year. I swear. Go dogs. Crazy. Go dogs. Come. We're at projection. Uh, We're at pre- prediction <laughs> time, and we got a bark in the background. That I don't know what is. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, last year on the show, uh, when I when I picked Georgia to win the Natty, thirty four seventeen was the, the similar barking was going on. Love um, it. So I think Georgia will have a lot of different interesting combinations of the front seven. There's too many good athletes on this team for them to not get pressure off the edges and up the middle. Uh, they'll What they did last year worked. It's not like they got to go find a new defensive scheme to fix this offense, right? Like, and what they did last year was they, you know, they played six in the box and they, they stopped the run with those six and they, they blitzed with those, six or they blitz five of them or you know they they did a lot of different things rushing and i think you're going to see a lot of different faces kind of in that edge that nolan smith is normally at i think you'll see marvin jones there i think you'll see jalon walker there i think you'll see dumas john or mondon or you know marshall you'll, you'll see a lot of these guys and 
the end of the day, man, Georgia's just got better players and they've got more of them. And, you know, I think it's going to be Tennessee's defense when you get to the third quarter and the fourth quarter mm -hmm. that, that looks thin, you know, yep. and, it's, it's, and they are thin. They're thinner than Georgia up front for sure. And yep. I think that Georgia, this is like, this is the game where Todd Monken's finally letting the cat out of the bag. This offense has put up 500 yards without really trying all year. And, yep. and they've done it with a lot of games where they shuttered everything, you know, with 15 or 20 minutes to go. I think that this offense is going to have a big day. I think that, you know, Stetson Bennett a year ago, I really kind of would have worried about him in this spot. Mm -hmm. When you play in some of the games he played in last year, that Michigan game, that national title game, and you come through the self-belief that he has, I think is a huge asset. And, and, you know, Tennessee, they answered the bell in the fourth quarter against Bama, right? Like, yep. you know, so I, I don't think they're just going to go away or fold, but this crowd is going to be a big factor. And there's this misnomer going around that because Tennessee runs tempo, the crowd can't affect their offense. How many places did we show where they're checking, you know, they're, they're uh, running motion to check from man to zone. Beers. Absolutely, and especially with the packages that Georgia's going to put in front of them, I think they're going to be a lot of communication that they're going to try to be getting. Right, the crowd absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that Georgia's going to come out and they're going to control the line of scrimmage in Tennessee. You know, they'll make some plays, but mm -hmm. what Georgia's always been good at, we've talked about on the show for a long time, like if they give up a big play, they make tackles. You know, yep. I mean, we saw the one long touchdown last week, but that was the first – time we've seen it here right like a, a, a 78 yard touchdown like that um and i think georgia will just win in the red zone more often than not and so uh yeah i think that ground game is gonna have a big day i think georgia's gonna lean on them and lean on them and then you know they'll hit play action and they'll use those tight ends and it's just todd monken there's not really anyone I'd rather have in the booth if I was a head Correct. coach of a football team for a game like this. Correct. I'm going to go Georgia. You know, I thought what was interesting, this over-under opened at like 59 or 60. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, and then and then it, the line opened at Georgia minus nine, which almost is Vegas saying like a, you know, a, what like 35 to 25 kind of game yep. or yeah 34 yep. 26 something like that um yep yep i am intend i'm inclined to think that georgia's going to score into the 40s as well i think mm -hmm. tennessee you know they will probably get into the 20s but i i just i think this is i think there's a chance this could be a a route dude I really do. I think everything is kind of setting up for Georgia to just come in there. They're pissed it, off. They're disrespected. This crowd's going to be yeah. crazy. Like, yeah. And Tennessee is not. This Tennessee team is not played in an environment like this. You know. Yeah. If if Georgia gets a stop on Tennessee's first drive or two, but yes. especially that if Georgia gets a stop on that first drive, I think this. I think the route might be on. And you I think the first few, the first two drives are going to be a big big indicator. I agree, and I think Tennessee script is going to be really good. So if they yep. go down and score on the first drive like they did last year, I wouldn't be too worried as a Georgia fan because, like mm -hmm. you said, like the adjustments will come. Yeah. But you know, I I think Tennessee might find a matchup at some point in this game. But like we were talking about, like if there's a matchup they like, Georgia Georgia has another four or five star dude right behind that guy yep. they can put in. And so, uh, yeah, I think this is like. Georgia statement game. The, there's just too many vibes. I think Georgia. I'm going to go Georgia. 48, Tennessee mm -hmm. 28. Nice. I maybe like 24. It. Maybe 24. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, Listen, I don't know. I'm just curious. Like their field goal kicker sucks, man. And I think that's a big. <laughs> I do think that's a big deal in this game. Like if I'm wrong and this is a close game which it very well could be. There's a ton yeah. of variance in this game, which just makes it hard to yeah. predict. But yeah, if there's – It's hard. Like, their, their field goal kicker, he made the one that counted against Bama. Hats off to him. He's a legend forever, I'm sure. But, but you're, you're 
they're, they're just still not very good as a special teams, you know, field goal kicking Correct. unit. And I think that's that's a big factor in this game because I think it could – like if Georgia gets up like we're kind of talking about and Tennessee's coming down in the red zone and they don't trust that kicker, then I think, you know, you could have some field goal situations. I mean, Tennessee goes for it for a lot, goes. a lot. Yeah, that's what I'm goal. saying. Like I mean, they've, go, they've gone for it on, you know, I think 17 to 18 times on fourth down. Yeah. And Georgia, Georgia is also perfect this year on fourth down. Versions. I think they're nine and nine now. Um, awesome. So, so if, so we'll give you two Georgia, Georgia route 48, 24 ish. Yeah. What, uh, what's, what's the alt line? If <laughs> the alt line, like if this, you know, I think this could be like a, I think this could also be easily like a, you know, a Georgia. I'm just convinced that Georgia is not going to shut them down on defense. Co- yeah. Correct. Yeah, correct. I, I, I don't, I, I, so I'll say this um, because we got to wrap this up too. Uh, Georgia I've looked at this. I've watched the film. I've watched Tennessee's defense. I've watched Georgia's defense, Tennessee's offense, Georgia's offense. I'm supremely, and this is this is me, Homer hat off, and looking at it objectively. Um, I am much more confident in Georgia's offense. I'm I'm much. I'll say it this way. I'm much more confident in Georgia's defense to get stops than I am in Tennessee's defense to get stops, and the offenses. They play different styles, but they both get a lot of yardage and score a lot of points. And so when you look at those offenses and you say, hey, 500 yards a game, over you know 43 points a game, you look at that and you say, all right, well, which defense do you trust to get some stops? I mean, it's, it's obviously Georgia. Um, and so I, the other thing that I will add, there's a lot of players players on this team on this Georgia team that played a significant amount of ball last year when you were number one in the country when every game counted when you were getting your best shot from people uh who yeah. went through who played in the Alabama game and saw you know the mistakes that they made personally that saw the 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 pressure cooker of that SEC championship game that played in the natty like like I Tennessee you got Alabama at home like your that's your that's your environment of the yeah. best team that you've played in the last three years for in terms of the people on this football team, their biggest stake, the, the highest stake game that they've played. You got it at home and you still had a chance to lose the game and Alabama missed a field goal. So uh right. I, I think, you know, uh, I give Tennessee credit for winning that game, but Georgia the experience. I think of just being in those games, even if you didn't play that much, being on the sideline of those games, being in the locker room of those games last year. Um, um, I'm going to give Georgia a, a bump and an edge in confidence there too. If I was a Tennessee fan, I would be worried that they they might come out too high and kind of like mm-hmm. crash, you know, like a, a sugar mm-hmm. high almost. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know, man. The more we're talking, like, I, yeah, I just I feel like Georgia is going to keep them into the – you know, in low to mid twenties range, and I think Georgia's yeah. going to score forty plus. Like it's you know forty two twenty one or yeah. forty five four, you know forty one twenty. I don't know yeah. somewhere in there, but I just I don't. Well, at some point, talent takes over, and yeah, if, I, I tweeted two weeks ago that that I watched four Tennessee games in full, and I was confident that Georgia that Tennessee wasn't going to score twenty eight versus Georgia, and I think that's still the case. I think it's 24, 27 maybe. I don't. I don't think they get to that twenty eight mark. In this yeah, game. and even if they do, <laughs> even if they score into the thirties, mm-hmm. God forbid. Even if they score into the forties, you know, at some point Kirby Smart will spontaneously combust. But even after that happens, like I don't have an issue or a concern about Georgia going drive for drive with this offense. I don't right. think that's what you want to do, but like right. if dude, I'll put it this way. If Stetson Bennett plays a clean game on Saturday, Georgia will, will win this by, yeah. you know, 17 plus. Yeah. Like if yeah. And the transit of property, the, the, game. the transit of property doesn't exist, but Anthony Richardson threw for 450 yards on this Tennessee defense. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stetson going consistently over 300 yards a game. Like I just, yeah, I, I think Stetson Bennett uh, between sets a minute, Brock Bowers, Darnell Washington, Kenny McIntosh out of the backfield. Um, 
Ladd and Jackson, Arian Smith has the potential to create some separation. I just think you got playmakers that can that can take the top off. I also think that a big part of this game, like as we look back on it next week or on Sunday, will have been mm-hmm. how good Georgia's perimeter blocking is. Yeah. Like I think that Rose Me, Dylan Bell, mm-hmm. uh, you know, McConkey, mm-hmm. the tight ends, like those guys are going to block their asses off on the perimeter and I just I think Georgia will be able to run the ball off the middle and I think they'll be able to run the ball off the edge and when you can do that it really makes everything else easy and you really get to kind of pick your shots and and just dictate the terms and you know this game though it all comes down to run the ball and who can't Mm -hmm. and I think Georgia can run the ball and I think they'll be able to stop Tennessee from running the ball like when they were pissed off last week against Florida, 13 carries for 13 yards, and mm-hmm. that's the most explosive running offense in the country. Like credit to Hypo and Tennessee for getting to this point, how they have, but there's a lot of smoke and mirrors involved in this. And correct, the Alabama they beat is not the Alabama that you think it is, and that has totally skewed all the expectations. So we both like Georgia big. big. Any closing big. thoughts? No, uh, hop over to dogcentral.com if you haven't already. Um, you can sign up, uh, uh, create an account, uh, click the monthly subscription, and you'll days free to try it out. You can cancel if you if you if you want to before you pay. Um, so seven day free trial. We'll be pumping content um, all weekend and uh, and looking forward to this game. Looking forward to a big weekend of of college football. So come see us. Sounds good, John. Always a pleasure. All right. See you.